Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 32, Episode 13. Coming up on this show, we've got the doppelganger hit and runs, the Navajo X-Files, and the antique portal to hell. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. I'm intrigued by the antique portal to hell. Is it like you open a cupboard and you just go through and you're in it's hell? A, it's a woman that goes to an op shop and there's an Indian salesman and he's trying to sell her this beautiful screen. And she's like, oh, this is fantastic. No, she picks out the screen. It's like a privacy screen. Yeah. And it's got a beautiful old mural on it and she's en- enraptured by it. And she says, I want this one. And he's like, but I have a better one at home. And he keeps trying to sell her this screen. No, She says, no, 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 no. I want this one. Maybe he was just trying to pick her up. No matter what she does, he's like, no, no, no. You have to get this screen that I've got at home. It's way better. I'll even show it to you. Come to my house. She's got to catch a flight the next day. She's like, no, no, thanks for the offer. But I really want this one in the store. So she pays for it. He's like, great, I'll send it to you. She flies back home. And uh, she gets the package a few weeks later and she opens it up and it's not the screen that she wanted. It's not the one that was in the store. It's obviously the one that he got from home. And it turns out (laughs) there's a very specific reason why he wanted to get rid of it, which is that it is literally a portal to hell. (laughs) (laughs) He just wants to get it out of there. So the question I suppose that comes first to my mind is, why wouldn't you just throw it out? Is it one of these like haunted artifacts yeah. that you can't just throw away that you actually have to like transfer the curse to Pass someone else? Pass it into the fire, yeah. burn it. That's and, the way to do it. And she's it. kind of the like, fire. destroy it. No. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, no, I really like it. So even though it's the wrong one, it's a portal hell. She's like, yeah, well, it fits with my decor, so why not? She's still got it. She's still got it. Yeah, she's still got it. So I'm assuming on this episode, we're going to be going into her experiences with that said portal. No, it's kind of like uh, just something I found at the end of the day, which oh, I thought okay. was hilarious. But I'm what are you be, going into? I'm going to be going into Stanley Milford Jr.'s new book, The Paranormal Ranger. Oh, I missed this. Yeah, this guy's a, a Navajo ranger. He was for over two decades. And it turns out when you're a Navajo ranger... You'd see some serious stuff. Yeah, they had a special X-Files division. Really? Like, and like I, officially? Yeah, because one day they got a call from uh, this really concerned rancher. I think it was a, a woman who saw a Bigfoot steal one of her sheep. <laughs> he had a sheep under his arm and they claim they saw him like in Did the she early just hear on the wind like a... Yeah, in the early hours of the morning, he was jumping over the fence. He had a sheep under his arm and they were just enraged. And they, um, they called out the police. Well, they called the police and the police were like, how much have you been drinking? So they called the rangers, the Navajo rangers. And the rangers turned up and didn't take it seriously. And so he explains in the book, Stanley explains in the book, that the chief of the Navajo rangers gave the entire department a massive chewing out after this. Why is that? Well, he said, it doesn't matter how crazy the case may sound. It doesn't matter how extreme or silly it may sound. You let these people down because you showed them that you you didn't care. You need to... Show them that you care, you need to listen to them, and you need to treat every case as if it's an important case, yeah. as if it's something that deserves your attention. And you don't was, indulge them, but I guess you have some empathy towards yeah, them. Yeah, it, it was just very unprofessional the way that they treated it. And so what this chief decided to do was create this kind of special division within the rangers, and uh, Stanley Milford, the author of this book, and his, um, his partner, John, his name was, I can't recall his surname, but they they headed up this division and they were responsible for all the weird call-outs, which included a ton of Bigfoot sightings, but also uh, UFOs, um, a lot of skinwalker activity, which I'll be going into in a moment. Okay. Uh, intriguingly, because Stanley had his own experience, which is uh, pretty wild. So looking forward to going into it. Just glad you're here. It was rough on the Tuesday show. Yeah, thank you for handling that for me. I really, this has been a bad year. 2024 has just been a year of hell for, for like, particularly in Queensland. Uh, all these, I, I mean, I can't complain. I have all these people around me at the moment that have turbo cancers. Like, it's truly dreadful. Really? Oh, yeah. It's just, it's really strange what is going on. But yeah, I just, I got knocked down with whatever that cough was that you had months ago. Mm. I still haven't beaten it. No matter what I do, when I got a whole heap of tests, got all the, you know, poked with everything and yeah. blood taken and not, nope, can't That's find anything. the one my daughter's had for over three months now. Really? Nearly four months. Yeah. 
yeah. still coughing. So that's the problem. When you're coughing, you, you can't do a show. You know, I had to leave the other day for the show, so I'm like, I can't keep on doing that. But I think I'm okay. You can probably hear my voice a little bit at the moment, but you look, sound fine. Look, I'm back, <laughs> and we'll we'll jump into the show. So in the plus extension, actually, uh, I'm going to continue on from what I was talking about last week, mm-hmm. uh, where we've got people that are, are frontline workers in the medical field that have experienced uh, end of life experiences, shared death experiences, that kind of stuff. But funnily enough, uh, much like many of the experiences that people have in these fields, it, you can see that there's kind of, I guess you could call it uh, subcategories of experiences that tie into other things. And I noticed that doppelgangers seem to be, play a part in this as well. So I'm going to go into some crazy doppelganger experiences uh, that includes things like strange clones of people that appear right next to a person and start acting out what they're doing. And sometimes then it will kind of pick up on the intention of what a person wants to do and then acts out what they want to do, even if they don't or they can't actually do it. Yeah, so right. Very, very odd cases we've got coming up in our plus extension. Interesting. Well, let's go into the paranormal ranger. Let me just organize it on my screen. I was so disorganized. I didn't get it centered. There we go. Stanley Milford Jr., a Navajo investigator's search for the unexplained. And yeah, he talks about how he got into this, uh, he he grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. Uh, he's half Cherokee, half Navajo, um, but he had a very kind of Western upbringing. He didn't sure. grow, he didn't grow up on the the Indian on a reservation. reservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he would visit his grandparents who lived on the the reservation, and it's on the Navajo Nation, which, if you're not familiar, it covers that Four Corners area. Oh, which is a hotspot of paranormal activity. Yeah, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. So this huge, huge area. And the Rangers started years years and years and years ago as really a force to protect the um, the ruins in the area. Right. All the the, the old buildings and old artifacts and because a lot of tourists would Cans, come in. Is that and, what they're called? The like stone structures and that kind of stuff? Yeah, just all the, the all the ancient stuff that's there. People would come in and kind of take a little bit as a souvenir. Yeah. So they had to have this force Which, that would police it all. Any person who's familiar with paranormal phenomena or even watching one of those old Brady's Bunch films knows that you don't take rocks from you know, any of these sites, whether yeah. it be Hawaii or anywhere else in America or anywhere else in Australia. Anyway, you just don't take them. And this then expanded out to general policing activities. They do like animal and wildlife control. They do all sorts of stuff. So it's not just like being a police officer. It's a very multifaceted role. And uh, they even get SWAT training. And so it's very broad. It's very, very broad. So these guys aren't your average cops, uh, especially when they're out there doing paranormal investigations. And so for 11 of the years uh, of the two decades that uh, Stanley was a, a ranger. Yeah, he said he was part of his covert team investigating UFOs and paranormal activity across the Navajo reservation. His partner, Lieutenant Jonathan Dover, eventually retired and then Stanley continued the investigation solo. And it was during one of these cases I'm going to mention on this uh, segment that he realized, oh yeah, I'm kind of like the paranormal ranger which is how the book came about. He decided to compile everything that had happened to him over the two decades into this, this book. And so he said, uh, yeah, he grew up in this small town in Oklahoma, but his grandparents lived on the, the range, as I said, and very big family. So it was always the extended family hanging out at the grandparents' place. But he was a little bit removed from the cultural traditions, as I said. He didn't speak Navajo. They used to make fun of him because of his Oklahoman accent. but one thing that became apparent is the kids that did grow up on the reservation, they had a very staunch belief in the supernatural mm-hmm. to the point where they wouldn't even question it. Like he tells one story of when they were kids and, you know, they're playing under the moon. They're all out late at night. And one of the kids, one of the teenagers saw something move on the, you know, the edge of the hillside and screamed out skinwalker. And immediately all of them scattered and fled. Like, it wasn't even a question of, what did you see? And yeah, he, could it be an animal? It was just skinwalker bail. Well, he said immediately, his response was, hang on, well, what did you see? Describe it. Let's check it out. Like, what it actually did you see? But no one else thought like that. Everyone was just out of there. And he says it didn't register with him in those early years that any of it might be real at all. Did he go to look at what it was? No, they all just kind of scattered in the, mo- the heat of the moment. He just ran as well. 
But he says it was another decade before he would realise how right his cousins were to run. So very early on, you think, okay, so what happened to you? There must have been something personal. So he goes through his early years, you know, how he got involved in policing, always interested in policing television shows as a kid, the idea of being a cop, you know, eventually got the chance to become a ranger and went through all the training. But he said before he actually became a ranger, he did have this experience which confirmed the the supernatural reality that can occur in this region. So he said it was 1986 and he went to see the movie Maximum Overdrive. Have you ever seen that? No. <laughs> Apparently it's based off a Stephen King novel. I haven't seen it. But it's got a lot of ACDC in it and heavy metal, which is why he wanted to go and watch it. Anyway, he goes and watches this late night showing and he comes out of the cinemas and he's in the lobby area of the cinemas. And he said when he walked into the lobby, there was an elderly Navajo man just sitting down on one of the couches and he seemed to be waiting for something. And he goes up to this guy and, you know, says hello. And this old man says, oh, is there any chance you're heading to Fort Defiance? And if you are, can you give me a ride? And he was heading in that direction. So he goes, sure, yep. Hop in the car, brother, I'll give you a lift. And so he said, this guy was probably in his mid-80s and he thought, it's kind of weird that this guy's out so late. But, And it's very weird that he's at a Stephen King movie, <laughs> like full of heavy metal, you know, at midnight. This is really strange, but I'll give him a lift. So he drives him home. He said, this guy was friendly and normal. They didn't talk a lot because, like I said, um, Stanley didn't speak Navajo. And this guy mostly spoke Navajo, so they were just kind of quiet in the car. But eventually, he's driving along the highway, pitch black night, obviously. The moon's hardly out. And he says, um, this guy just says, oh, pull over here. Just in the middle of the road. Yeah, he wants to be let out. And so Stanley pulls over and he's like, are you sure? Because there's nothing there. There's no streetlights. There's no homes. There's no gas station. It's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> There's nothing there. And this guy's like, yeah, I just, I need to get out here. This is my stop. So he's like, okay, he lets him out of the car. And uh, he starts driving, lets the guy out, starts driving to his dad's house. And he says, yeah, it was just me in my sister's car on this lonely stretch of highway. And as he's driving from the field to his right, he said something caught, some movement caught his eye. And he, he looks out the passenger side window and he sees what at first he thought was a horse running next to the car because he just sees movement. And I've got a bit of audio here. He was on uh, the podcast UFO with Martin Willis about a week ago and he retold this story. So I thought I'll just, I'll play you a little bit of the clip and we'll take a listen to what he saw. And as I was on that stretch of highway outside the passenger side window, on the inside of the right-of-way fence, there was something moving there as I was driving, and it was running, and initially I assumed maybe it might have been a horse or something of that nature, but this thing jumped the fence, the right-of-way fence, and it continued getting closer and closer to the vehicle till it was within a couple of feet of the vehicle, and it appeared similar to what you see with a greyhound, but the top of this thing's back came up at least four feet or so to the top of the back. And it was all white from head to toe. It had a long, elongated, you know, canine shaped head with a long snout. It had a lot of jagged teeth. And the most notable thing of this thing was it had these two eyes that were like they were self illuminated. And at one point, I locked eyes with it. And mm. this look, thing is looking straight at me. And then, you know, your blood turns to ice water when that yeah. happens. And I slid down as far as I could in the driver's seat and just barely seeing over the, the, the steering wheel and dash. And I floored it. I didn't look back at it. I don't know what happened yeah. to it. I don't know what it did. I didn't look in the rear view mirrors or anything. Once I'd seen this thing in its eyes, that was enough. And so I come sliding into the driveway at the house and, and I ran inside and my dad happened to still be up and I explained to him what I encountered, what I witnessed. And that's when he said, yeah, son, that's, that's a skinwalker. 
He said his dad didn't even flinch. Like yeah. it was just kind of a normal thing. That's that's interesting. He said though that he kind of had this um, more westernized upbringing. So I'm surprised that his father, but perhaps if his father had, you know, a more uh, American Indian upbringing, then it would just be inherent to him. That's like, yeah, that's a skinwalker. They still kept a lot of the traditions mm. and the the native beliefs. They, he just had a Western kind of lifestyle. You know, it also sounds like uh, some of the stories, not all of them, but some of the stories you hear of pale crawlers. Like this is a term which is used by, you know, more so people that aren't, you know, American Indian, but they're describing the same kind of thing. They've got very, very pale skin, sometimes white, uh, sometimes described as having these jagged, terrifying teeth. But the glowing luminescent eyes, colours vary from yellows to reds to, you know, even greens in certain circumstances. I've got a clip later on from his partner, Jonathan Dover, who describes some of those intricacies of the skinwalkers. Because these guys would get a, a ton of sightings called in when they were eventually part of this special unit for the Navajo Rangers. Well, they would have become the go-to guys, right? Yeah, one of the aspects was that the people in the sightings were describing white individuals who were shifting before their eyes. And when you say white, do you mean white skin or as in like, like I, I mean, unusual albino white? I mean white paint. Yeah, yeah. Like literally paint. And he describes, um, Dover describes how they use paint and there's a particular ingredient of the paint that's important, which really? we might we might go into later. You mean from like a, a incantation spell kind of idea? Yeah, from like a witchcraft yeah. perspective. So... That experience, I mean, he's kind of laughing when he's retelling it there, but obviously that was chilling. And he says he made eye contact with the thing and understood its nature was evil. And so this really made him realize it cemented for him that, okay, these stories that my cousins heard growing up and some of their experiences, maybe they are real. Maybe this stuff really happens. Um, so forgive me for perhaps not understanding. I'm a bit behind with my cold. Uh, the guy, the elderly guy that he picked up, was it like, it was all kind of uh, orchestrated so that he would have that experience? Is that Well, maybe that guy's the skinwalker. Well, yeah, that's the other possibility. But that's what I'm, But why was he waiting in the movie theater? Oh, and then, I have no idea. And then idea. he just happens to pick the guy up. And, you know what I mean? It's like... I have maybe skinwalkers like Stephen King movies too. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I feel like these sorts of things have some type of... Um, and perhaps, you know, I'm being paranoid, but I feel like there's a path behind them. It's like they're kind of orchestrated. There's something to pull people into these kind of things. Yeah, you're right. It definitely feels like a setup. Yeah. The whole guy waiting for him at the end of the film. I mean, did that old man even go into the film or was he just, yeah, exactly. you know, waiting yeah. for Stanley? And then for him to fall into this place of like saying, oh, do you want to lift? Mm. Like, I mean, maybe it's different times. Maybe it's a different place, but I wouldn't imagine walking out of a movie theater and just looking at some old fella sitting there and going, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to give that guy a lift home. Well, like I said, after this, he eventually went through his ranger training, uh, passed everything well, and became a Navajo ranger. He said it was really uh, difficult but fulfilling work because there's, like I said, there's such a range of responsibilities. Of course. But he said even on the regular jobs, the paranormal intruded. Uh, he said there was one particular instance during my rookie days that stayed with me and made me realize patrolling the Navajo Nation would involve far stranger cases than I had imagined. So he was called to this small community in the southern part of the reservation where 26 sheep had mysteriously died. And there was a veterinarian who had been called out by the ranch owners, and he was a very experienced vet, had never seen anything like it. Were they exsanguinated? He ended up calling the rangers because he had no explanation. So, yeah, Stanley arrives and uh, immediately he gets this gut feeling that something's not right as soon as he arrives on the property. And he talks about this a lot, saying that he would utilize this sixth sense. Uh, he would get this funny feeling in his stomach, you know, hard to describe, but th that no, I get it. gut feeling, yeah. we get it, right? And he often said when there was entities involved, he would get a headache in a very specific way part of his head, well, which this is, is where a I weird go back detail. What I was just saying before of like, was this guy somehow initiated without yeah, even realizing? Well, that's never, that's never really explored. But these sheep are found dead in the corral, no signs of struggle from a predator attack. And he says, look, predator attacks on the reservation are reasonably common because there's stray dogs. Anywhere everywhere. in agriculture, it's common. And you can tell the, the signs. You can see entrails everywhere and there's a struggle and there's just chaos, like there's dead animals everywhere. But he said this was so strange because the sheep were just almost lined up and they had each been slit from throat to groin with perfect precision and kind of opened up. Was there blood? 
no blood at the scene. Like you asked a moment ago, was there exsanguination? And yes, you're right. There was no blood at all. Well, this lining up as well is, I'm just, oh, it's creeping me out, but it's consistent with what Linda Moulton Howe was experiencing when she researched cattle mutilations in the 80s. Yeah. So obviously, if you're familiar with the show, you'll recognize the signs, clear case of cattle mutilation. But one thing he mentioned was the odor. He said it was just this horrific, unnatural smell. And you'll never forget it. He described it as being a combination of burnt tires, burnt hair, and decay. Nothing to do with the livestock. Well, it was obviously coming from them, but it was just completely alien, the smell. Well, yeah, you know the smell of a dead animal. We've all driven past roadkill, so this would be clearly something quite different. The family had sheepdogs who didn't come out during the night because they likely didn't hear anything. They wouldn't, they wouldn't go into the corral after the event because, yeah, they were too terrified. So Stanley knew from his experience that, okay, this, this is not the normal predators. And this isn't someone who's just crept in and sliced them open. There was no footprints or anything like that. And you can't hold a sheep. Like if you hold a sheep no. and you shear it, yeah. <laughs> even if you're shearing its wool and they've done it a thousand times, they still sh- struggle. Of course they do. So, and yeah. they would struggle even more doing something like that. But the case remains unsolved. And pretty quickly, you discover with a lot of the cases he reports, there's no conclusion. It's like these guys formed a paranormal research outfit, but they really didn't solve anything. They're just like going out there and checking on the weirdness and going, well, all right, I don't know. Well, I I say this with, you know, the deepest of respect, but does it become a cultural issue? It's like it's now hush hush, like we'll look at it, but it's like. No, it's just there's no answers. Right, okay. There's like, there's, they, they, they scoped out the place the next couple of nights, didn't see any activity. There's no evidence to be found. It's just an unsolved case. The family members didn't report lights in the sky. And- Nothing like that. So he, we then skip ahead to 1998 and Stanley was part of a manhunt. There was uh, heavily armed fugitives responsible for the murder of a Col- Colorado police officer. His name was Dale Claxton. And uh, he was at a traffic stop and yeah, these militiamen just, gunned him down in cold blood and so there was this huge manhunt they brought in the SWAT team and there was operations for months trying to catch these guys they never never caught him but he was out there on these operations getting SWAT training to try and catch these fugitives and so it was on some of these night missions that you know a couple more strange experiences occurred so one of them it's I mean it's a pretty basic one for our show but it, it sets the scene for what happens later because he's out with night vision goggles and he sees what he thinks is a satellite and it's just, you know, slowly going overhead. And he's like, oh, there's a satellite. It's like orange satellite. And then it starts doing zigzags mm. in the sky and eventually zips off over the top of them with no engine sound, nothing. Do they see a form? Do they see a structure to it? No, he just, he saw it with his uh, naked eye and with the night vision, but uh, that was it. And he just, he thought, okay, that was strange and just got on with his police work. But amazingly, he claims he saw it again in 2008. He so said, 10 years later. Yeah, he said he encountered a familiar site while he was working with his now partner, John Dover. They were on a mission to recover a drowning victim's body in the San Juan River. And there were severe storms in the area, so the water level was really high and it was pretty rough. A lot of debris, so they had to camp near the river at night and then continue looking in the morning. Anyway, he's in his cot and he's looking at the stars and he sees it again. It's this amber-colored light. And he immediately thinks, I saw this thing 10 years ago. And it's in around the same spot as well. He says it was larger than a typical satellite, moving in the same zigzag pattern across the sky. He calls out to his partner, John. They can both see it. But he realizes as it's crossing the sky, there's two F-16s behind it, like trying to keep up with it, with their afterburners f- on fire. Um, Amazing. And it gets closer to them overhead. And he said immediately, it just yeah. took off and vanished. He says it was like mark a thousand instantaneously. It was insane how quick it was. And the F-16s were just, like, they just peeled off. There's, there was no hope they could pursue it. But again, what struck him was the fam- familiarity of what he saw earlier. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was kind of setting the scene because there's a lot of activity associated with UFOs that occurs later on. But back to that 1998 manhunt, uh, he had been out on a long mission one night and had come home, I think it was like three in the morning or something, just exhausted, or he'd gone back to their base camp of operations. And basically what they were doing was going out into the Four Corners wilderness and trying to find these guys who were hiding out. 
a difficult thing to do. Yeah, and it's obviously it's a huge area, and, and it's dark. Like I said, they they couldn't find them in the end, but um, they found the bodies of these guys years later, and they'd all been assassinated. So there's a whole other story. So there. like the assassins had been assassinated. Yeah, like someone had cleaned up. Yeah, like it's a really kind of dodgy story. But anyway, he got back from this mission and he decided to sleep under his truck because I don't know. It's like you won't get rained on, I guess. So he gets under his truck and he like gets in his sleeping bag and starts to maybe doze off. And he looks over and there's someone lying next to him. But it's like a black shape. And he's just, it's like a weird black glob lying next to him. Like, and he immediately goes, oh, and sits up and bangs his head on the bottom of the truck. He looks back over and it's gone. And so... This was the first of a bunch of uh, weird, creepy sightings like this that started to occur amongst the uh, the Navajo Rangers while they were out there. Was it humanoid, or as you say, it was just a blob, like just a? He said it was humanoid shaped, black, and he had the sense that its face was looking at him, but there was no features. He just had that feeling. Uh, so he ended up sleeping in the back of his truck with his rifle. He was absolutely terrified. And he's like, look, I, I know what sleep paralysis is. It wasn't that. It was 100% real and visible. I wasn't paralyzed because I just sat up immediately when I saw it and it disappeared. Um, he says it was looking right at me. So there's a lot of stories like this. and I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. Uh, and I'll link to the book in the show notes, of course, because he goes into great detail. And it's not just a paranormal book. He talks a, a lot about his policing work. And it's yeah. really, it's intriguing because it's not, like I said, it's not your average cop. They get into some really interesting stuff, like fun stories of rescuing goats and you know, things like that. So I never would have thought that rescuing a goat could be fun, but apparently so. Apparently it is. 2002, this is where they get a call from this, uh, <laughs> it was like, this woman calls and she's like, Bigfoot stole my sheep. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they send out the rangers and two rookies they ended up sending out who'd basically laughed at her. And this woman was so pissed off, she chewed out the chief and the chief in turn chewed out the rest of the rangers. He gave them this big, long speech about how unprofessional it was. He said, as Navajo rangers, we're public servants. It's our job to do the best we can, no matter what the case is. And so he related this incident with the Bigfoot report of it running off with a sheep. And he said, look, our entire department has failed this woman. So starting from now, we're heading up a special division. And he, it's basically the Navajo X-Files. He says, from now on, reports like this are going to be investigated by you guys. And he points to John and he points to Stanley. And I just couldn't resist. I had to get an X-Files meme in there. Some kind of... Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> now you well might done, think, Ben. What well a done. corny, cheesy joke. But many of you will not realize that in season three of The X Files, Fox Mulder, David Duchovny's character, is healed in a Navajo healing ceremony. Have you seen that episode? No, I recall the one where the uh, like one of the experimental aircraft crashes and the pilot swaps with an old Navajo woman. Oh, and really? Like, and he's stuck inside her body, and so like the pilot who's this you know built pilot, and he's like, oh. But meanwhile, there's this old granny woman, Native American woman, and she's just <laughs> like, I gotta kick ass, you know. I just really not scared at all. I found the scene today. It's become tired and weak, and it searches for rest. There he is. This was my Thursday night in my teenage years. Yeah. Watching watching these. And then Mulder starts to float into space. And the G-Man comes and talks to him while he's in this altered state. It's too hard or the wish to join his ancestors too strong. The body will give up. Anyway, super corny. But if the desire... I don't remember that at all. I don't remember that episode either, oh, but yeah. it's in there. So, yeah, my Navajo X-Files joke has purpose. It has meaning. So... Or not. <laughs> <laughs> let me go through a couple of the cases he mentions. One of them was the San Juan River case. This was from 2003. And a Navajo boy encountered a massive, hairy, seven to eight foot tall creature near the San Juan River. Obviously terrified him and his family. They send out the authorities... And Stanley and John investigate the area and end up finding uh, 14 to 18 inches long footprints. 
And I'll link in the show notes, there's a presentation that um, Ranger John Dover gives uh, where he actually shows the prints. Uh, do I have them on the video here? No, I don't think I've got them. But they're basically uh, five feet apart in the stride. So these huge prints. But yeah, I'll link to this video in the show notes. There's one of them there. And take it down just a hair. I'm getting a little ring from the speaker. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to make out at first, but I, yeah, I, I can see. It's 22 inches long. He's like the Rex Gilroy of it, Navajo Rangers. I wasn't going to say that, <laughs> but I was thinking it, yes. They do find more interesting prints. I think here's a screenshot later. Yeah, that, see that? That's like a nice 18-inch long print. And they were finding these all over. Whenever they were investigating these cases, they would find this kind of material. They would find hair that they got analyzed for... DNA and it just came back unknown predator uh, or unknown primate in some instances. So yeah, there was a lot of investigations, but again, really, I'm surprised that they would actually, to be honest with you, spend the money to have the analysis done unless it was, maybe if it was affecting livestock levels or something, perhaps that's where they would go to. But it's a lot of money to, especially back in 1998, to get those samples analyzed. I don't know how much funding they had, but like I said, they had this special division, so maybe they had a bit of yeah. leeway. Uh, then around 2009 or 2010, they both investigated a, a UFO and ET sighting reported by an elderly Navajo man in Arizona. And this is your typical um, case where it was like a 25-foot wide spherical craft kind mm -hmm. of descending in his backyard. And he goes out. This guy was really old. He's in his 80s. And um, he could see these beings emerge from the craft and they started walking around his property. And, and what do the beings look like? He just said they were like skinny little boys. That's how he describes them. So probably greys. And he goes out there and he ends up taking a big fall. And he's 80 years old and taking a fall when you're 80 is no, you're hip. no small deal. So he took a while to get up. By the time he got up, he saw them getting back into the craft and they got out of there. So Stanley and John went out and interviewed the guy and found him in, in a very credible witness, uh, very you know sober, and they found tracks everywhere. They found these strange tracks. They said they kind of looked like um, small, like small birds almost. But oh, really, like so what three toed? Yeah, and we've heard that before in some of these cases. And they found they found like imprints where he said the craft was. So it was an interesting case. Well, um, the three toed creatures uh, show up like in uh, the Kentucky Goblins was one example yeah. where I called they were, I think they were three-toed. Um, but the other one was like with uh, even the start of Hellier with, well, not Mont Hellier, but with Greg and Dana Newkirk when they were doing the research in that area, there was like those three-toed footprints. What I found most interesting about this, because we've heard a million of these UFO landing cases before, sure, but yeah. they got in touch with MUFON and MUFON said, we're going to send out some investigators. And MUFON investigators didn't arrive. Bigelow guys arrived. And he said these Bigelow guys had all this crazy equipment. And he's like, I still, to this day, have no That's idea what they odd. had with them. And he said they wouldn't talk about anything. You know, you'd ask them, what is this? What are you doing? And they would just go, oh, you know, it's a thing. They, they wouldn't answer. Very, they were very um, closed-mouthed about what they were doing. And he had multiple instances where the Bigelow guys, the Bigelow aerospace guys, would turn up for these investigations. And remember that the Skinwalker Ranch is in this not area. It's not yeah. far away. So it seems as though they were doing a lot more than just Skinwalker Ranch. They were going around to sightings and activity in the surrounding areas and using their strange technology to do what, well, we don't know. Yeah, but, you know, what's funny about this particular area, it's like uh, JC Johnson and his Crypto Four Corners has been looking at this for... You know, at least well over a decade. Sadly, he's passed away now, but like he's done some great research into speaking to American Indian pe people of American Indian descent who have been harassed by these strange creatures. In fact, there's a really great video, which I'll link to in the show notes if I can find it, of, um, of him speaking to a young woman who was harassed by like a clawed entity that was trying to rip off the air conditioning unit. That's right. We covered trailer. that one on the show. Yeah, years ago now, but it like it's just stuck with me. Um, but these stories are, you know, they're common in this area. Very well, common. Uh, after this guy had this sighting, his dog died a week later. Really? And prior to that, um, all its puppies disappeared. Yeah, okay. So this is something that ties in with this, you know, these events of the physio or the physiological effects that occur. Well, yeah, and the animal mutilations as well. Mm. So anyway, four years later, this this seems to kick everything off and 
we have a sense of the the perils of being an investigator into this type of activity. It's not just a simple thing of going and taking people's um, eyewitness reports, writing it down, right. having a look and finding some prints on the ground. No, the phenomena starts looking at you. Yeah, there's something else that comes along with it that maybe he wasn't expecting because one evening Stanley, you know, got home from a long day at work, <clears throat> went to bed as usual. He reads for a few minutes and eventually uh, dozes off to sleep. And he says later that night, something jolted him wide awake. He said it was like being poured, like having ice water poured over you. It was that sudden. Mm. And immediately he's blinking against this harsh light in the room. He's like, where's this light coming from? The lights were on. It wasn't like UFOs or anything. The lights were on. He knew he had turned them off before bed. But anyway, he reaches out for his remote because he's got a remote to turn the lights off. And he realizes he can't move. He's paralyzed. He's like, what's going on? Is this some kind of sleep paralysis? Because again, he knows about it. And all he can do is move his eyeballs and he looks around the room. He's like, everything seems fine. And then he looks at the foot of the bed and he said that that's when he saw the figure. A figure stood there in front of my closet next to my dresser. He said, before I even fully understood what I was seeing, my body's fight or fight, fight or flight, sorry, reaction kicked in. He's still paralyzed though. He can't move. He said, the only thing I could do was study it in detail. He says it was uh, dull gray skin, and he just goes on with the description we know. That's a gray. Yeah, larger than a human head, the size of a soccer ball, classic shiny black, wet-looking eyes, four feet tall, and it's just staring at him, not moving. He said it stunk. Yeah, they do. Remember? The number of times we've heard that the grays stink, and there's a number of theories as to why. It's like one idea is that because they don't have a, a gastrointestinal system, they absorb substances through their skin, but because of that, they also excrete excrement it's like through their skin. Shitting. Yeah, they shit their through skin. their skin. This disgusting. is why we've got the shit skins in the past. That's disgusting. Yeah. He said it was like a sickening, putrid, petroleum like stench pervading the room. He said it reminded me more than anything of the air surrounding oil drilling fields combined with the odor of something dead or decaying, it's which is interesting because that's how he described that's what saying, the yeah. mutilation case with the sheep. It's yeah. almost the exact same description. He says it was nauseating. I felt like I could vomit. And it felt like an endless amount of time he's staring at this being. And then he realized he can't hear anything. So there's no sounds of the cars. There's no sounds of the insects. It's total Oz effect in there. It's just you, you could hear a pin drop. All he can hear is his heart going crazy and the breathing. He says, then without warning, the paralysis left me. And he immediately leaps up, like, ready to go kick the thing's head off, right? Ready to go. But obviously, it's gone. Gone. It's, and that's why he was probably released, because it had, it had vanished. Now, without stopping to think, he immediately grabs his handgun, and he just starts sweeping the house. Yeah, you would. Checking every closet, checking under the bed. He's going outside into the yard. He's just sweeping the entire house. And obviously, there's nothing. Does he live with anyone? Do he have a, a wife or kids? Do they? I don't know. That's never mentioned. It's never mentioned. I, I think he might be on his own. But he, um, he ends up clearing the house. There's nothing there. And he's about to go to bed. And he feels something like scratching under his neck. And he's like, what is going on? And he reaches down. And it's the tag for his shirt. Oh, his shirt's on back to front. And he re realizes, my shirt's on back to front. And then he looks down and he's like, hang on a second, my pants are on back to front. <laughs> classic. Classic. We, classic. We know where this goes. And he doesn't expand on this. He says, this is the first time I've shared this story. I just wanted to include it. He's not ready to. In case people that have had this experience don't think they're crazy. It happened to me. He says, I don't know what to think about it. So he obviously hasn't looked at this further, or at least we don't know about it. He hasn't done any hypnotic regressions or anything like that. So we, we don't know the extent of the activity and how it's been messing with him. But isn't it telling that he's investigating these cases yeah. and then it's in his well, life as well? In all honesty, my advice to him now would be don't get hypno... Um, hypno what's it called? Sorry. Uh, hypnogogic. Yeah, hypnogogic. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I'm confused. Like, it's not a hypnogogic experience. I mean, it could be. I mean, may maybe that's what occurred, right? Because you're already looking at these paranormal topics. It's kind of at the front of your mind. You do have a hypnogogic strange experience, strange experience, but it's so consistent with so many other abduction reports. But my advice would be don't get hypnotic regression. 
because I feel like you're better off not knowing. It yeah. just opens up a can of worms. Yeah, it really does. Because <laughs> you really have, unfortunately, if you can wake up paralyzed with some entity inside your house that's able to dematerialize before your eyes, you have no way to defend against that thing. Yeah, that's true. Well, he then moves on to what I think is the most compelling story in the book. He said after that initial UFO case with the old man, they had this relationship now with MUFON. And this led to another investigation where Dominic Mancini, the MUFON investigator they'd worked with, uh, called them about this case that was actually on the Navajo reservation. It had been reported to MUFON. And the case involved this man, his name was Hoss Laws. And he wasn't a native guy, he was a you know white guy. And he was a second language teacher on the reservation. So he was teaching English. And he had a Navajo wife, lived on the reservation. And he reported a bunch of sightings to MUFON. And after these sightings, well, the sightings, like in so many of these cases, seem to unlock the doors to something else. Mm. So it all began with these lights in the sky. Hoss lived in a mobile home on this small farm in uh, Greasewood, Arizona. It's about a mile east of this mesa known as Satan Boot. Interesting name. There it is on the screen there. Real place. Uh, it's obviously the name is adapted from the Navajo lore. They believe the the mesa is inhabited by a giant serpent. Okay. Which is where it got the name, but they won't go near it. And according to the old stories, like when they had cattle, if the cattle strayed onto the mesa, it was like, well, so, we just got to wait till they come back. We're not going up there. Yeah. So he starts seeing these lights on his property near this Satan boot and, or butte or whatever it's called, butte. And if you look at the landscape around there, totally wide open mm -hmm. and, you know, a couple of dry creek beds uh, and again, a very sinister legend surrounding this area. And he tells this story about how one evening just after dusk, the horses are outside uh, and he's feeding them and he notices this strange light hovering over the butte. And he couldn't make sense of it. He's like, what is this? It's not a plane. It's not a car. A few nights later, he sees the same light again. He described it this time as a large UFO shaped like a spade. He said there were red lights stretching across its surface, but he said there was tendrils coming off the bottom of it. Oh, so it's like one of the jellyfish craft. Well, he even suggested that these tendrils were attached to other things that were flying off it. So it's this really unique uh, sighting. It's like a mothership sighting. Yeah, and he said the movement of the... The craft seem obviously deliberate, controlled, and he's mm. watching this thing, and it accelerates into the butte. It goes into that mesa you see on the screen there and disappears into the mountain. Mm. And we've heard this time and time again with yes. these reports that they can enter the uh, solid rock. Well, that, that's the thing about this. As much as that's an incredible encounter, it's just, it's not surprising. Well, you missed that show on Tuesday. So on that solo show for Plus members, I covered that Project 8200 book, which oh, is, this is remote viewing, was very it? fortunate it arrived from uh, Skip Atwater. And this was a case based on Pat Price, who was with the remote viewing program with Hal Putoff and mm. Russell Target SRI. And one day, uh, Pat Price walked into Hal Putoff's office and he just slapped all these papers on his desk and said, Hal, Last night, I was out of my body and I've been searching the earth and I found four alien bases. And Putoff is like, okay, and was pretty skeptical. But because of the nature of the program, Putoff had to report everything to the CIA higher-ups, right? And it just so happened that uh, Pat Price was talking about this mountain in Australia. So Putoff reports this to the CIA higher-ups. A few days later, he gets a call and it's from Kit Green, who was the CIA liaison with the program and Kit Green's like uh you know I we followed up and we called the CIA station chief in Australia and we mentioned this mountain to him with no context uh, do you mean Pine Gap is that the no, station? It's no Mount, okay. Mount Zale in the northern, northern territory it's in the middle of nowhere oh so there were actually is a base there there's a CIA base no 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 they just called when I say they called the the station chief I mean like the Australian CIA head right okay like they call him right and they say hey uh have you ever, like, what's going on with Mount Zale? Is that, is that on your radar? Do you guys know anything about Mount Zale? And without skipping a beat, this station chief, this CIA guy in Australia, says, oh, you mean where all the UFOs are flying around? Huh. So they took that as this confirmation that what Pat Price had remote viewed was somehow legitimate. Like, there might be something to it. And are so, there any Aboriginal stories from that area? 
I don't know if there's even Aboriginals Legends. out there. There's yeah, just nothing out there, right? So 10 years later, they, they sat on this report and uh, Price describes like four ET bases around the world. There's the Pyrenees, Australia. There was one in Alaska and there was one in um, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And they sat on this report and then 10 years later, just as like a fun exercise, Skip Atwater was running the remote viewing program for the army, um, Stargate. And he decides just as a fun like curveball for his top remote viewers, he's going to give them unknowingly the coordinates for these bases, these underground bases. And these guys start describing underground caverns with technology, with ships, with cables and strange pulsing machines. And none of them have any idea about Pat Price's stuff. And they all seem to confirm what he reminded it. And now we, we're all the way over in Arizona and we're getting stories of these craft just flying into the Mesa. Is, well, there, is there something under there? I mean, it's funny that we should mention Rex Gilroy twice in the, in the same show, not even about him, but it was the same. Rex Gilroy was claiming that he had reports of people in the Blue Mountains in Australia, in New South Wales, mm. seeing craft flying into sheer cliff faces. Yeah. Very common. Very more common than you would expect with UFO reports. And in those Pat Price original remote viewings from 1975, it's funny, uh, there's this detail. You've got to get on plus to hear these stories, by the way, but... There was a detail where he was remote viewing the alien base and they had ramped up all the security measures and there were new security measures for these entities that if anyone didn't have a particular like badge that was sealed onto their uniform, they would be killed on the spot. And he said the reason for the increased security at this alien base in Australia was that 3,500 of them had escaped. What? <laughs> 3,500 of these entities had escaped into the Australian wilderness and they, they now had the base on lockdown. This was according to Pat Price's remote viewing. Do we have a and time like, frame for this? 1975. See, that's interesting because there's our stories from, you know, 80s. Remember I was telling you of like people on military exercises seeing weird figures stepping out from behind trees. Well, then he later went on to say that many of them successfully integrated into society. <laughs> I'm just like, what? What, like body snatches or? I don't know. You'll have to listen to the Plus episode to get the details. But uh, yeah, so he sees this craft fly into this mesa. And um, he's like, all right, th this is weird. I I've got to capture this thing, right? I've got to get some evidence of this. So he buys a high quality digital camera and he, he goes out onto the mesa and he tries to capture a photo. And his wife didn't believe him, but she ended up seeing it as well. So he had multiple people seeing it. And I found an archive from uh, the old Phantoms and Monsters blog that had the photos up from the MUFON post oh, years ago. Oh, pointing though. I 2010. Mean, it's again, it's just so typical of these, these photographs that like, it's just a light in the sky. Yeah, obviously nothing. Like obviously it's, it's meaningless to us, but he got something. And yeah. it, to him, it was he got something and MUFON came out and investigated. Um, so once he took this photo that's on the screen here, and again, if you're listening to the audio, it's just a light in the darkness. But once he got this photo, then the floodgates opened. What do you mean? So a few days later, he's working in his garage and it seems as if it comes out of nowhere. This mangy, sick looking dog appears and it's like all the bones are sticking out. It's hardly got any hair left and it's just like limping into his yard. And it's obviously in bad shape. It's probably got rabies. And his other dogs were terrified of it, wouldn't go anywhere near it. Now, he realizes he's got to deal with this. This is a stray. It's dying. He's, he's got to put it out of its misery. Especially and, if it has rabies. Yeah, he says, well, he explains that there's no real animal control because the area is so big and mm. they just don't have the resources for it. So, And there's a lot of stray dogs. And it, he says for his safety and, you know, to put it out of its misery, he's got to take care of it. So oh, what I understand. He, he ends up doing is he, he gets a um, two by four. He gets a big two by four and, you know, he quickly clubs it to death. Like he hits it once and to kill it. And as he kills the dog, he said this puff of something came out of it. Like it, this, this wafting cloud of, what he thought was dust or dirt because it's like a dirty old dog and like some of it, he breathed some of it in. He's like coughing a little bit and he's like, what is this? 
Anyway, he gets a tarp and he covers the dog and he goes inside and I think he's going to get, um, he's going to tell his wife what he's doing because he's going to take it out and he's going to go bury it, right? So he goes inside, he tells his wife and she's like, okay, well, you know, be quick about it. He goes out to where he had killed it and it's gone. The body's gone. No other dog has come along and dragged it away or a predator. There's no prints. There's also no tarp. And I think the four by four was gone as well. So it's surely just, that means it's just like a neighbor's driven past for whatever reason and picked it up. No, he said it was like 30 seconds. The, so this okay. is in the middle of nowhere. And then you can see up and down the road. and There's, there's, no, there's no neighbors. It's like the middle of this ranch, right? Like oh, You just can see the photo. Like, like, look yeah, at it. There's, there's nothing fast. there. Yeah. There's no neighbors. And this dog corpse is gone. And so he's like, what the hell is going on? Now, he couldn't find any sign of it. He obviously looked no tracks, nothing. Within hours, Hoss got really sick, really sick. He was curled up in bed. It felt like a stomach virus or a flu. Uh, he became sicker and sicker as the night went on, and his wife started to get really, really worried. Um, and she, because she was Navajo, she, and she, he told her what had happened, she's like, this is witchcraft. This is a curse. You've been attacked by something. But Hoss refused. He's like, no, no, just take me to a doctor or something. I don't believe in that stuff. Anyway, he eventually became so sick that his wife saw no other choice and he couldn't do anything. So she drags him to the car and drives him to a shaman, to a medicine man. And the medicine man performs like a Navajo ritual with herbs. And apparently this helped. He recovered almost instantly, like a light switch had been flicked on. And he was almost back to normal. Well, the curse had been lifted, obviously. The medicine man said that what he thought was a rabid dog was a skinwalker and that the dust that plumed out of it from its fur when he struck it was corpse dust, which is a type of poison used in witchcraft. When Hoss breathed it in, the the curse took hold, he said. So only a few weeks later, after this, he had recovered he saw two more skinwalkers on the property. And it was like uh, Stanley's description of when he was uh, in his t- early 20s, when he saw this thing pursuing his car. Now, Hoss claimed he got out his pistol. He tried to shoot them. But every tri- time he pulled the trigger, it would just click on a pistol he'd been shooting at the range the day before that he knew was perfect. Every time he tried to shoot, it would not fire. When they were gone, the gun fired perfectly. Now, Stanley said he's actually heard this from other eyewitnesses on the reservation as well. Things malfunction around these things. Now, he said within a few days of the second incident, something started bothering his horses. The horses were blowing and snorting. They were all upset. They were huddled up in a corner of the corral. And Hoss went out there. He expected to find maybe another stray dog or some predators. Who knows? But instead, he sees this metallic cylinder hanging vertically in the air over the horses. How large is it? Um, Like a water tank? Eight feet tall. Okay, yeah, so like a water tank. And there's some kind of hazy mist glowing around it. So it's ionizing the air around it. Now, Hoss is totally based, so he gets his gun and he starts shooting it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it was just a pellet gun, but he said he could hear the ping, ping, ping off the metal instantaneously the object shot towards a neighbor's home, went around their house, disappeared. So it's interesting how, again, all this activity intermeshes. It started off with these lights over the mesa. He sees a craft fly into the the rock. Then he has some kind of skinwalker curse. How are the two things related? I I was just thinking that because also in a sense, it's like you've got this very um, traditional... Uh, like a cultural kind of uh, phenomenon that's occurring, like a skinwalker. It's like it's an animal. It's what you'd expect with this kind of thing in this area if it was a curse. But then you've got this highly technological, metallic, modern, manufactured, even futuristically manufactured machine that's behaving in this fashion. It just doesn't make sense. Well, John and Stanley are called to go out and investigate this case. Remember, they were contacted by MUFON. And he says, look, I wish I could say that things ended happily for Hoss, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Both he and his wife experienced significant illnesses while on the land after this encounter. Hoss was traumatized by his experiences and felt that he no longer belonged. He moved off the reservation, which is perhaps what the spirits who tormented him had wished for all along. So what Stanley is alluding to there, and he goes into more detail in the book, obviously, but he thinks that 
perhaps locals that practiced witchcraft or whatever, this dark magic, didn't like him because he was a Navajo. And they saw him teaching English as a threat. Right. Because they want to keep their Navajo nation. So it was like, get out of here. And he, th- those were some of the stories going around and he started to believe them. So he ended up leaving. But I, I mean, I may be inclined to believe that if it were for the fact that only, yeah. you know, like non-Navajo people were experiencing that, but clearly Navajo people were experiencing other phenomena. But what's that got to do with UFOs flying into the Mesa? Well, nothing. Are the skinwalkers driving them? I doubt it. Are the Navajo witchcraft, no, I, I, witch doctors in fact, driving them? It, it might even be that it just so happens that this area, because of its uh, properties, maybe enhances the ability of that magic, which has been practiced for a long time to work, but you've also got the other activity, which is not connected to it, occurring in the same location. Well, Stanley's partner, John Dover, when they were first assigned this uh, project to head up this X-Files for the Navajo Rangers, he said all the other guys were like, thank God it's not me. Because a lot of this stuff is obviously a heavy taboo yes. within Navajo culture. And there's very specific taboos about... Probably wisely so. Spirits, like you don't whistle at night because that's what the witch doctors use. You know, you don't talk about the dead in certain situations. Like there's a lot of taboo. And investigating these things, I think these guys were picked because I think John is half white. Yeah, and semi-outsiders. Because, yeah, it was kind of the same for Stanley because... He didn't speak Navajo and he had this more Western upbringing. But here's John. I've got a a video from John. This is from the talk he gave that I mentioned earlier. And I'll link to this full talk in the show notes. It's about two hours long. But here he is talking about the difficulties with even discussing skinwalkers on this reservation. Because there seems to be risks that occur just from bringing up the topic. Let's take a listen. Oh, hello. Have I got audio? So we are going to talk about the skinwalker. I usually pause at this point, and if any, we ask if any Navajos are in here and they feel really uneasy about this subject, they can go take a coffee break for a few minutes and then come back. So, and just to give you an idea, both me and Stan have been attacked just for speaking about this subject. These things can kill very easily. They can poison. They can curse you. Stan, we got done talking about this one day, and he felt like somebody stuck a knife in his back and just twisted it back and forth. And he had a remote healer that lives in Tucson work on him. And that remote healer was able to alleviate that pain. And he says they're watching you every time you talk. We spoke out of a radio station in Maine, and we were on the phone out of Gallup. As we were speaking, when we got to this subject, they said that their whole radio station just went to static. And as soon as we finished talking about it, they came back on the air. So all kinds of interesting things. The first time we spoke about it was in Oregon at McMinimus or at McMinnville, Oregon. And after we got done, Stan and my families had nine near head-on collision or intersection accidents in our families in the next weekend. So it's a little bit of... That's not a coincidence. It's a bit of a curse. I mean, a lot of these cases are probably coincidence, but not all of them. I don't... Because they're dealing with things that are... Pardon me. You know, they're dealing with things that are supernatural in nature. They're not your regular police activities, right? Yeah, but even, I mean, what he's describing, it's like like the radio station, for example, with the static coming on. I don't think it's actually limited to just skinwalkers or this particular belief system. I think this is yet again another representation of you have a, uh, a different culture, a unique culture, interpreting the phenomenon in a unique way. And that's not to diminish it by any means at all. Um, but then you have also other reports. You know, Nick Redfern has raised this on many occasions where, you know, he's just some British guy living in America but starts looking into the stuff. The number of times that he's tried to talk about, you know, certain topics of certain entities mm. where he's, you know, appearing on whether it's a podcast or a radio show, he's been plagued by technical problems or the recording doesn't work when it previously had worked without any problems or even in some circumstances, recall, he said that uh, there was tapes where... He captured a whole heap of stuff and it, he knew it was on the tapes, but then it was erased. 
like remotely erased. Well, later the best on. example with us is when you interviewed Michael Schratt and then you had a UFO exactly. hover over your home. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's the, you know, the, the activity we were talking about yep. that sh- showed up in the, our life. I think what is quite apparent with all this phenomena, whether it's UFOs, skinwalkers, or anything else, ghosts, whatever it is, mm. um, I think that it, it allows itself to be heard when it wants to be heard. It allows itself to be spread and spoken about when it wants to, uh, but when it doesn't want to, it doesn't allow it. And this is quite apparent with skinwalkers. They've got a lot of sightings of people that have seen these things with sightings similar to what Stanley described at the start of the show with this thing running beside his car. Mm. Here's another clip of John describing just one of those encounters. Let's take a listen. I had a kid that was, and him and his sister were on the road, and one of them was following their car. And they kept speeding up and speeding up. Pretty soon they were doing 75, and this thing was keeping up with them on two legs. We've had reports of people just driving down the highway. And these are not Navajos. Somebody's driving down the highway outside of Winslow. They see somebody painted white standing on the side of the road. And they said, as they watched, this thing dropped down on its hands in front and ran on its hands and its feet across the road faster than than an animal would run. So they are said to travel incredible distances overnight. They can take the form of a coyote which is, or a wolf, which is mostly what's seen. Or jackrabbits. Yeah, I didn't grab the full clip, but in the full clip I'll link to, he talks about the paint they use, and often they're described, eyewitnesses describe seeing a white figure. So is the paint, as we were saying before, does this act as like some type of uh, magical potion? He doesn't go into the, the details in too many specifics, but that's the gist of it. Um, I, I just quickly went through it this afternoon. I didn't listen to the full two hours, but yeah, he does talk about that in the um, the the talk from 2019. It's this one I had on the screen earlier. So I'll link to that full video if you want to watch that. It's an hour and 43 minutes long where he talks about many of the similar cases that I'm mentioning. Um, so the next one I just wanted to finish on is this, this case they call the Window Rock Haunting. This was from 2010. And this was actually a government building. And a bunch of the employees started to complain about strange stuff that was going on in the building. Like on late shifts, they were hearing disembodied voices. There'd be these weird chilling spots in the building that didn't make sense. Um, Objects would move around. Uh, They would get phone calls from each other's desks when no one was at the desk. Mm, And there would just be weird breathing and then someone would hang up. Just So the Navajo Rangers get called in, the paranormal ops team. and they were suspecting witchcraft. They were suspecting that they, they were targeting. At least some of the government employees suspected that as well. So this building had a pretty interesting history. It had been used as a theater, a library, but then a morgue, and finally an office space. There you go. <laughs> so, the morgue, uh, which will become apparent in the plus section, the, the, the morgue, I think, is playing an important role, there, yeah. especially with the affecting of electrical appliances such as a telephone. Yeah, which is the odd one out. Mm. Uh, so they go in and they, they do this investigation. This is quite a big part in the book, but I'll just do a, a brief summary for you. So the first night they go in, uh, Stanley goes to, I think it's not the basement, but it's the bottom floor. And he's investigating this area where several employees said they'd heard voices just coming out of nowhere. And he's walking along, he's just like checking things out, and he hears, or doesn't hear anything, he feels a finger just start brushing his lip back and forth, like a very clear finger just touching his lip. And while this is happening, he hears two people having a conversation in Navajo, but there's no one else in the room. He can't see them. It's just like coming from the air. And he questions them. He says, who are you? What are you doing? Like, who's there? He gets no response. Now, he's obviously unsettled, he's intrigued, uh, so they go back for a second night of investigation. This time he brings um, Tony Milford, who is his cousin, I think, Tony Milford Jr. He brings along um, Lavon Benelli, another investigator, and Dusty Delgado. I don't know if they're rangers, but they're either you know related to him or they're rangers as well. So Tony and Dusty arrive, and they have a bunch of 
high tech equipment to try and you know do the usual paranormal investigation, right? And he starts he talks about a couple of EVPs, like he claims he hears Navajo voices on the tape. I didn't go into any of that in great detail, but I what bet I, you they're identical to English EVPs of like I'm sure he said this, well, and it's just static. It's interesting you say that because he said one of the accents was clearly a Scottish woman. What? Yeah. The rest of them were in but Navajo. But speaking in Navajo. And this is, no, she's just, no, oh. she's just in English, but with a harsh Scottish accent. Uh, but he said during the investigation, coins started to fall from the air all the time. That's a guy's phenomenon. Yeah, like it, there would just be two of them would be talking and a bunch of quarters would just appear and then drop to the floor. And this was happening over and over again, like dropping behind them, dropping on the table in front of them, clearly manifesting in the air. And he checked the ceiling to see if things were rigged, but he started to see them just pop into existence. In the end, uh, over those two days, they collected 65 coins and they were just regular quarters, right? Uh, they also saw air uh, orbs and there was, you know, chairs being pushed around and a vase exploded and a bunch of like poltergeist stuff. But I don't need to go into that. You, you understand that stuff, right? Um, one interesting thing was they had an EMF meter mm. and it's got a digital readout of it on it. It goes up to like, know, like 2000 on the readout and it kept stopping at 666 and they're convinced whatever they, whatever was going on, an entity was making it stop at 666 just to try and freak them out. Could be anything. It's a bit corny. Yeah, when, you, when you hear that, you just go, mm. oh, it gets cornier, it gets cornier. Uh, the night following the investigation, he says it was around 9 p.m. and Dusty and I were sitting at the dining room table in my home. He said we were going through some of the images we had taken, going through the data, and they're both sitting there talking about the case and he hears this ping. He's like, what the hell was that? And he turns around and on the linoleum floor in his kitchen is one of these quarters. Interesting. It's just manifested in his kitchen. And Dusty is like, what is going on? He goes grabs his camera and starts basically doing a sweep of Stanley's house. Um, and as he's coming out of Stanley's bedroom, he crosses the threshold. Uh, Stanley says, I looked up from my own camera and I see five coins fall over his head. He said one of them was so hot to the touch, it left like a burn mark in my floor. So now he realizes for certain that it's followed him home. This investigation he's is fucked. now in his home. The coins continue to fall, he says. All of them land heads up. He says, my home has become a, a place of strange paranormal activity, which is still going on today. Mm. So this is 2010. Still going on. This is the problem with this stuff. You get it in your house. You have to move. But even moving doesn't necessarily no, get rid of it. It's like a stain you can never remove. Yeah, so you need either a, a medicine man or a priest or... Just burn it all down. Or burn the house down. And you, know, you need to bring someone in who is actually versed in dealing with this. Phenomenon. He says objects started to get pushed over or knocked over or explode in his home. He would hear things running across the roof, too heavy to be squirrels at night. His previously quiet and peaceful home, he said, had been invaded. Well, we're also, by the way, I'm sorry, but we've just brushed over the fact that he awoke with a grey standing at the end of his bed. <laughs> yeah, like, was point. this after? This is all. This is all after. So, so that, is that what's happened? So he's now like. So the grey was after he brought something home into his house. Uh, it's impossible to find the origin point. But he said the next day after the coins fell, he said, "I called my cousin Tony, and Tony was part of that investigation." And he says to his cousin, "He's like, you will not believe what's going on in my home." And his cousin says, "Ah, uh, is it coins?" And they hear in the background, too. ting, 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 there's coins at his home as well. Now, his experience was way worse. He had coins flying across the room as well as household objects. Uh, toenail clippers, for example, embedded in the wall with such force. When uh, Stanley went to visit, it was getting really disconcerting because they were watch walking through the kitchen. He claims a large kitchen knife got propelled from the holder, flew across the room in front of them, and wedged itself into a cantaloupe. <laughs> and, it, and Tony's freaking out. Now, they all sit down and discuss it. They're discussing this case. And uh, his brother, Brandon, had come over and he's just, you know, eavesdropping on their conversation. But he's really skeptical. He's like, come on, money showing up. And he cracks some wise, wise crack. He's like, if the spirit's going to throw money, why doesn't it throw bills? Like, why is it giving you coins? 
And his elderly mother was sitting in a rocking chair or something. And as soon as he said that, there's this this massive smack. <laughs> Get hit in the face like, of the water she's bills. Like, oh! And she looks down and she got hit with a bill. There's like a $10. There better be at least a Benji. There's a $10 bill. Oh, 10 bucks. Give us a bit more than that. And this is where it gets super corny. They claim that they opened it up and it said die in Sharpie on it. Oh, come on. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. Now, they're obviously taking, like, that's super cheesy, but for him, this is his home. He's got kids. He's like, screw this. I'm done with this. We have to put a stop with this. And thankfully, someone's got some sense. Uh, one of the friends was like, uh, there's this pastor. He's, you know, he's a Catholic guy. He's He does exorcisms. Give him a call. So this pastor comes around and they all read prayers and smudge and they end up burning all the coins in this fire in the backyard. How do you burn coins? I don't know. He just like in a ritual, just okay. like threw them in there, put the bill in there. He said when he put the bill on the fire, it went- Did a ghost go come? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In yeah. green yeah. flames. Yeah, I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> and a skull flew out. Yeah. No, but he said after they did this, it actually broke it for Tony's house. But Stanley said, I never bothered to do it with my house. He says, it doesn't really bother me that much. You know, I try not to get scared about the activity. Um, he said, even when a Taiwanese coin turned up in my house, I, you know, I didn't really worry about it. Yeah, but it's not necessarily about being worried about it. I know, it's, it's right? more about the fact that the, it's occurring in your home. That's supposed to be your safe place. Yeah. You want it out. Like, is there some spectral monkey crawling on your roof at night? Get rid of yeah, it. Yeah, get rid of it. So, Well, what's happening the, while you're asleep? The irony of this case is that building they were investigated as being haunted ended up being the Navajo Ranger's main office. They all had to move there because they found mold in their other office. Oh, my God. <laughs> so all of them had to move to this haunted office. And he said it was Did still- they all contract it? It was still haunted. And he said it actually got worse. There was one evening he was cleaning out the office fridge because someone left their sandwich in there for too long. And he's got his hand in there and he says he watched as two scratch marks slowly formed, like a line going up his forearm. Oh. And then blood just started to seep out. And he says it felt like a cat had scratched him, but there was nothing there. He couldn't see anything. See, that's where this stuff does become, and, and that in itself as well could be considered to be a little bit cliche. But where this stuff truly does become terrifying is is like this, this physical kind of attacks. And you know, yeah, it's one thing to have coins falling and dollar, but like his grandmother got hit in the face. Like it shows that it can physically manifest to injure and and hurt people. Why would you not want to get rid of it? I know. And he says he keeps smudging to keep it under control. That's like, don't keep it under control. Destroy it. It's like the lady with the portal to hell. I'll, I'll probably have to tell in the plus extension. She just doesn't want to get rid of her portal to hell. She wants to keep it. Yeah, but that's the problem. So this stuff, it's kind of like, it, it's cool at the same time. And it's also like, it, especially the way that we live now, if you have an object that can do something like this, right? Not only is it kind of cool to show off at dinner parties, that like, oh, hey, check out this haunted portal I've got over yeah. here. But it's also like it kind of, like in our very cynical world about there being nothing else, people kind of cling on to this stuff because in a way it demonstrates that, well, there is something else. Well, you asked earlier if he is married with kids and I think this information maybe confirms that he doesn't because if you had kids, there's no way you would put up with well, this Well, I thought stuff. you said he did have kids before. Did I? Yeah. No, I don't think he does. Oh, maybe I misinterpreted. Uh, well, you're right though. Like what no, you're his cousin had kids. Oh, his cousin yeah, had his cousin kids. Had oh, kids. right. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, well, then, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like if you have a family, you're wanting to, because your kids would be terrified, let alone your partner. So this connects with another bout of high strangeness. So it's years later, it's March 2014. He's called to investigate a Bigfoot sighting at a woman named Gen Geneva's home. She lives uh, New Mexico. It's kind of near where this guy with the Satan's butte, where the, he's had all these weird stuff going. Satan's butt. Satan's butte. Um, she and her family had witnessed Bigfoot activity for years, strange creatures and having sticks thrown at them. So Tony and Dusty went along. They conducted experiments. They heard Bigfoot calls and wood knocking, you know, the usual basic stuff with Bigfoot researching. Um, but he said one night after midnight, we heard animal growls and he claims he was using night vision goggles and a, you know, the FLIR scope, the, the therm thermal scope. Yeah. yeah. And he could see it. He saw this 10 foot tall humanoid, no neck, <laughs> like football player physique, walk out behind two trees and start walking towards him. He said he could see the detail in the fur and the hair. And he said he, 
he, part of his mind was going, this isn't real. Like this is, this is something else. But another part of his mind was going, shut up, idiot. It's right in front of you. You can see it. Mm. And so this thing starts walking towards them and he's bracing himself, like watching it in the, the FLIR scope and yeah. disappears. Yeah. But isn't it fascinating? So what he's had now, he's, he's had experiences with UFOs, greys, uh, skinwalker type animals, like or possibly cryptid type animals. Uh, you've got weird cylinder shaped objects flying around, disappearing into into you know solid mm-hmm. material, and then you've got a Bigfoot. Like he's experiencing the full spectrum of this, which suggests to me that he's not actually experiencing anything that he's seeing. He's experiencing these entities that can manifest in these ways. But oh, you know, so you're saying that it's that's just how they're that's how displaying it's themselves, right? Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting idea. Well, he said that. It oh, didn't, and poltergeist. It, yeah, it didn't go behind a tree. It it vanished into thin air. And he, the other researcher, Dusty, was with him and also saw it on the scope. So the next day, they go back. They go to the same location and they try and see if there's any evidence, like prints left behind or anything like that. They can't see anything. And they end up walking down this incline where they had seen it lurking on the scope before. Mm-hmm. Again, no signs of it. So they decide to walk back up this dirt road to where their vehicle is. And as they're walking up the dirt road, they hear this thud and this rock next to them. They're like, what is that? Okay, weird. Keep walking. A bigger rock, this time a a fairly sized boulder lands next to them. And they turn around and they can't obviously can't see anyone that's throwing these things. And as they're going up the hill, this keeps occurring but the boulders are getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it's at the point where if one of these hits us, we will die. And they're thudding down next to them until finally when they get closer to Dusty's truck, they hear something shoot through the trees and they can hear like branches and twigs snapping. They said it sounded like a cannonball had been fired. And this giant thud, this huge doof runs lands next to them this thing is 30 pounds over six inches thick 12 to 14 inches inside this this size this solid sandstone boulder has shot out of nowhere landed right next to them now dusty's like let's get the hell out of here he's freaked out and stanley says he's finding it kind of amusing because he knows that it's not going to hit them it's just telling them to leave but anyway he goes to get in the truck and as soon as they get in the truck he says They start hearing this noise on top of the truck and they get out and there's coins all over the top of the truck. What the hell? He's like, coins? That was four years ago. Yeah, but coins are the calling cards of Poltergeist. Yeah, what is going on? And they get out and investigate and then more coins start dropping into the back of the truck. Now, obviously, they, they drive out of there And he says, I couldn't work out what the connection might be, but the event drove home for me more than ever that there truly were other dimensions and that there were beings who could reach through those dimensions where spirits or Bigfoot or UFOs live. Oh, so he's actually quite bright. Like he's he's kind of catching on that it's not what it's presenting itself as. He's seeing the connection, but he might also be jumping to a conclusion, making the assumption that these are all distinct Yes, yes, yeah. But They're what not. we've seen from recent shows is that they might not be and that, you know, the orb you see and the UFO and the skin wall and all these different things might just be, as you alluded to, manifestations of something else. Mm. And so I, I just want to play a final little audio clip here from his partner, John, who noticed this. They noticed this with their investigations that whenever you see the big hairy guy, all this other stuff starts happening. Let's take a listen. We think that what we found out over a lot of years is that when we started seeing increases in Bigfoot sightings, we saw corresponding increases in what we call flybys or UFO sightings. Flybys are, oh, I saw a light that was blinking, had a bunch of lights going around the middle, a sphere, and but it flew by. It didn't land. Nothing came out. So it's a flyby, right? Just like a drive-by. And so we started seeing increases corresponding with each one. In UFO cases, Bigfoot has been associated with occupant sightings. We had one over in Crown Point 
where Bigfoot showed up with the UFO. We've got to put Stanley Milford Jr. in contact with Stanley Gordon. Yes, the because look, it's, it's the same thing. It's it's fascinating because Stanley Gordon, Stan Gordon, brought this to you know the public, the general public, with his you know report from the 19, 1973, where there was just this huge amount of reports of Bigfoot phenomena associated with UFO phenomena. Two discrete, independent forms of phenomena which you wouldn't expect to be connected, and yet there's just so many of them. And now all these years later, decades later, you've got someone else on the other side of the country or halfway on the other side of the country reporting the same thing anecdotally. Just like it's this casual thing. Yeah, so some great stories in there, some really good research. I'll Mm. link to the book in the show notes. The Paranormal Ranger, a Navajo investigator search for the unexplained. That's from Stanley Milford Jr. And I'll link to his partner's presentation which was over an hour and 40 minutes as well. That's on YouTube. So that'll all be in the show notes at mysteriousuniverse.org. And let's talk about the portal to Helen Plus. Yeah, we've run out of time. I want to hear this. Because I was going through his book and he's meant to be the paranormal investigator, right? Mm. But he didn't have the tools to resolve any of the paranormal activity. So then I realized there was another work that came out this week, which would have been perfect for him all those years ago, which is the book of psychic self-defense by Liana Greenaway and Belta Greenaway. Is this akin to like uh, Dion Fortune? Yeah, like the classic Dion yeah. Fortune one. Yeah, in a similar sense, it's got a bunch of experiences and stories, which is why I went into it. But real practical stuff. Okay. Like if you see a great yeah, alien, just kick its face off. I'm sure kick its face off is probably not a recommended uh, protocol in that book. You need a specific type of crystal charged with the power of go. Jesus Christ. That, that looks about right. Is that actually in there? <laughs> uh, yeah, some okay. of that stuff's in there. All right, all right. Including a woman who buys a privacy screen from an Indian salesman that is incidentally also, unbeknownst to her, a portal directly to hell. Is the kicker that she takes it back to the antique store? It's no longer an antique store. It's like it was. There was never an antique store there. there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the no. The kicker is the the demons on the other side are rather amorous. Oh, Ooh. that's definitely probably for plus. Then. Definitely for plus. So if you want to sign up for that, head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today. That's not the end of the show. Over an hour coming up, you get more than double the content if you sign up for plus because you get these huge extensions we do every single Friday. And of course, you get an entirely exclusive show that comes out on Tuesdays just for our Plus members. Plus members also get an entirely ad-free version of the show. Uh, You get a higher quality MP3 version of the show as well. And if you sign up for our MU Max tier, you get access to our entire back catalog going back 17, 18 years now worth of content. All the videos and audio is on our website at mysteriousuniverse.org. And yeah, if you've got a Plus membership, sign in and it's all there. You can watch and listen to your heart's content. Again, nine bucks a month helps support your favorite show, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Tons of great stuff coming up in our plus extension apart from portals to hell. What have you got again? We're going to be going into doppelgangers when you have a run-in, like an actual run-in in your car with a doppelganger. We're going to be going into uh, some of the, actually the themes that you raised earlier, like with the strange mist coming off that dog. Uh, I've got some reports that are kind of similar to that, but more uh, wholesome. They're not, you know, cursing people. It's more about spirits leaving people's bodies. Uh, And of course, we'll be talking also about some of the experiences, uh, frontline workers in the medical field of experience that are on the the realms of paranormal uh, phenomena. Good and, stuff. Yeah, and far- paranormal activity. Awesome stuff coming up. Again, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Sign up today. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Thanks for listening. If you're on plus, stick around for the great stuff after the break. For everyone else, we'll catch you next week. Mm-hmm.